Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, Then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In January 2022, Karen Reed dropped off her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe, at a friend's house as a massive snowstorm swept through Massachusetts. Tired after a night of drinking, Karen went back to John's house and fell asleep. When she woke up in the middle of the night, John was not there. And just hours later, after a desperate search, she found him at his friend's house where she had dropped him off, lying dead in a snowbank. Three days later, Karen was arrested for allegedly hitting John with her car and leaving him to die in the snow. But Karen claims that she is the victim of a cover-up and that John was actually beaten by his police friends. This theory has garnered wide support from the local community. After nearly two years of dramatic court hearings, Karen's second-degree murder trial has been delayed. Our headline today is courtesy of NBC10 Boston. A surprising new development in the murder case against Karen Reed. As you recall, she's the woman accused of killing her Boston police officer boyfriend. Her trial was supposed to start next month, but now it's being delayed. The new tentative start date is April 16th. But as our NBC 10's Kirsten Glavin reports, Reed's legal team argues that's still not long enough. Today, we are speaking with legal analyst Josh Ritter to discuss why the trial date was pushed and how the prosecution and the defense plan to argue their cases before a jury. Hi, Josh. Thanks for joining us again. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good. I'm good. All right, well, let's get to it. This is an interesting one. We would have seen Karen Reed at trial in just a few days, but now the date has been pushed to April. Can you tell us a bit about why that's the case? Yes. I've done a lot of trials, and it is rare that you see this type of discovery and this amount of discovery coming up this late. They were about to start trial, and instead the prosecution turned over a mountain of evidence, 3,074 pages of documents relating to a federal investigation from the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they handed that all over to the defense causing the defense to understandably throw up their arms and claim that they need all sorts of time to go through this. And so the trial has been continued from March 12th to April 16th of this year. That's a lot to go through. Should we expect any information in the report that we have not heard already in the court hearings? That's a really good question and something that the defense and the prosecution cannot agree on. According to the defense for Ms. Reed, they are claiming that it's all brand new and that most of it appears to be exculpatory, meaning evidence that somehow is valuable to their client and to the defense that they expect to mount. 
The prosecution, on the other hand, says that, no, 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 we believe that approximately 90 to 95 percent of the material is consistent with the Commonwealth's theory of the case, meaning it really doesn't move the needle any more than everything we already have in front of us. Now, the one interesting thing I will point out is that for the prosecutor to say it's consistent with their theory of the case is an interesting way of putting it because yes. they're they're not necessarily saying it's not new. They're just saying it might be new, but it doesn't change anything for us. Well, the defense obviously has a different view of that, but the defense can also say, you're not the ones to decide what is important to us and what's not. Your whole mm -hmm. job is just to turn it over and it's up to us to decide whether or not it's valuable to us. So I am sure we're going to be seeing a lot of more litigation as it comes to this new evidence. So what can you tell us, Josh, about the defense's strategy up to this point? We've heard about this huge cover-up, and they seem to have their own explanations for evidence that could tie Karen to a possible murder. I will say that I think the defense has done an excellent job of creating a lot of noise. They have thrown a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, a lot of turmoil into this case beyond what you normally see. And that's because a large part of their theory is that this is an elaborate cover-up and that it is a conspiracy and that this is about police corruption and everything else. And they've done a really good job of kind of taking everyone's eye off the ball, as it were, to the actual evidence of was this a murder and who committed that murder. So there's been little discussion about the actual forensics and evidence surrounding the murder and much discussion about you know, missing discovery and federal investigations and police cover-ups and, and things of that nature, which leads to the question of how much of that will actually end up in front of the jury. And my suspicion is, though it may cause a bunch of trouble pre-trial, when you actually get to the trial, much of that may be kept out. I would say that your best defense is always going to be your simplest defense. And mm -hmm. when you start asking the jurors to believe that there was a cover-up and there was a conspiracy and people planted evidence and people manipulated the crime scene, it's just more and more that you're asking them to believe. But they are correct in pointing out that the strongest evidence I think that we've heard identified so far for the prosecution is that there is DNA evidence linking his body to her vehicle and what appear to be broken particles of her tail light that were left on his person. So it doesn't take a lot of explanation to put two and two together to say it, it was likely he was hit by her vehicle. Mm -hmm. So the cause of death, blunt force trauma. But the medical examiner was unable to determine the manner of death. And that kind of puts everything up for grabs. What are your thoughts? As they say, the devil is in the details. And this is a big detail, I think, that the defense is going to try to exploit, that even the medical examiner cannot say whether or not this was a homicide. And I think that's where the defense probably is going to find their strongest arguments is to say, listen, the circumstances surrounding this, this could have been an accident. How are you going to hold somebody responsible for homicide when even the medical examiner couldn't arrive at that conclusion? So it's not a small point and will definitely be something that the prosecution is going to have to deal with. Let's touch on Karen's relationship with Aiden Kearney. Now, he's a blogger who wrote a few articles defending the cover-up theory. He has been charged with witness intimidation, and there is evidence that Karen shared some information with him about the case that was not known to the public. After these articles were published, Karen actually had crowds of supporters show up to court. Now, realistically, will this affect her at trial, do you think? You know, that's a really interesting question. And this case is so fascinating beyond the circumstances of the alleged crime for the circus. And there's no better way to describe it than a circus that is surrounding this case. When Karen Reed enters the courtroom, it's a packed courtroom and half of the courtroom stands up to give her a standing ovation. And 
that's in no small part to a lot of these kind of independent bloggers and you know independent journalists, whatever you want to call them, have been following this and filling the the space up with all of these conspiracy theories that now it's taken on a life of its own. But to your question of how will that affect the actual trial, will it actually affect what's presented in court as evidence? No. So a lot of this, like I say, may be a, a bunch of noise beforehand, but it might not have much of an effect on what is actually takes place in court as long as they can find 12 jurors who haven't been somehow affected by all of this beforehand. In your gut, do you think the defense will convince the jury of this cover-up or it's too outlandish? It's really going to depend a lot on the rulings that the judge makes in the coming weeks. There are things like cell phone text message records that were recovered off of individuals who were inside of the home where the victim was found. And some of those have some text messages that are, I guess you could characterize as very curious. And so if the judge starts allowing some of this type of evidence in, then maybe the defense could get some traction. But if the judge runs a very tight case and doesn't allow a lot of that surrounding noise to come in at trial, then the defense is really left with nothing to argue to the jury other than the evidence of the crime itself. Do you think the prosecution will have enough to prove their case? I think the prosecution has enough to prove that her vehicle made contact with Officer John O'Keefe, the victim. But that doesn't really answer the question of, did she kill him or did she intend to kill him? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where the crux of this case lies is, can they prove that she was aware that she hit him if she in fact did hit him? And it seems like the defense may be exploring in that, but they're also trying to pursue this go for broke defense that he wasn't even hit by her vehicle. In fact, he was beaten inside of the home and then dragged outside and it was posed to make it look like he was hit by her vehicle. So wow, it's all over the map on this one. Truly, truly. The fact that her blood alcohol content was right at the borderline many, many hours after the last time she saw John alive. And scientists were able to determine what her blood alcohol content would have been at the time she left the party or wherever it was. And it is beyond, I think, three times normal. Yeah. And it's funny because you, you could see a way where that evidence might cut both ways. And to one extent, you know, it's clear she was intoxicated. Could she have a, perhaps run him over and not cared what happened? And took off and she was so drunk she she should be held responsible for her quote unquote bad driving but then at the same time i wonder if there's perhaps a defense built into that that she was so intoxicated she wasn't even aware that she hit him because remember she's being charged with homicide here not vehicular manslaughter so mm -hmm. i don't i don't know where the defense goes with that i would say at the end of the day it probably is more of a good fact for the prosecution than not well, we'll keep an eye on this one. But there's information, there's new information on the Michelle Traconis trial, another case that you and I spoke about on a Headlines episode just a few weeks ago. Could you quickly tell us what happened last week? I would say to the surprise of many legal observers, Michelle Traconis was found guilty on all counts. I'm not surprised so much that she was found guilty on some of the counts, the counts mm -hmm. dealing with her actions that took place after the alleged murder. I'm surprised on the conviction on the conspiracy to commit murder because that requires some proof that she was aware of what her boyfriend was going to do before he did it and that she was somehow involved in some sort of agreement or planning to commit it. Mm -hmm. So it was a where where I thought was the weakest part of the prosecution's case. But shockingly, she was convicted on all of those counts. I think the the prosecution did a remarkable job. And, you know, remember, there was that 
alibi diary. The diary. Where, right. They had written out everything they had done that day, which was just, I think, at the end of the day, so highly suspicious to jurors that that may have been one of the uh, pieces of evidence that pushed them over the edge. Thanks so much, Josh. We will see each other soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.